We're speaking of which, Friday night was really awesome. We had, uh, well, we had, what was it, like eight or so kids here at seven, which is when we normally start, but we've been doing these fifth quarter parties after the home football games, and um, a couple of us have been going to each of the football games and playing the kids and stuff. We had probably 20, 25 kids there, 20 kids? Probably. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Whoa. so there's there's <laughs> several new ones, you know, and it was cool. Um, the gospel was shared, and, and I don't know, I felt like it went really well. I was, you know, and, and several of the kids were were actually a little older, and um, like I think two of them were 19, and they they both like when they left, they came and like shook our hands and like thanks for letting us be here and all this stuff, and we're, you know, so it was, I don't know, it was it was just it was really good. It was cool. But they, but they still needed the gospel, and so they heard it, and hopefully that'll make a difference in them. So that was that was cool. I'm excited about that. So. Well, hey, we're going to be in Second Timothy today. Second Timothy. You know, uh, Sammy's been going through Titus with the girl, or actually she just finished, I guess. And so we had gone through that together, Titus, and then uh, I, you know, I was looking at First Timothy today, not today, but this week, in preparation for this, and I realized that like the the letters of to Timothy and Titus, like I'm I am the guy that like they're to me, you know what I mean, like. Titus was this guy that Paul had, was like training in, in ministry and stuff, and he's you know going to be put in in charge of some things, and and Paul writes a letter to, to this like young preacher or whatever, and, and so I don't know, just realizing that like I am the subject. So if you want to know who Paul is writing to in the letters of Timothy or Titus, he's writing to me. Um, so that's who it's to. Uh, so, which makes it really easy for me to, to go into those and, and find some, some things to say. Um, but um, Jim's been talking about what it means to be servants of Christ for the last several weeks. Um, I don't know, probably <coughs> even, I guess. And, and I want to I pitch in my two cents uh, from 2 Timothy here, uh, just on, on what it looks like to be a servant of Christ. You know, we started out talking about how... Christ was really our servant, that he came and um, he, he served us not only in, in just in the day-to-day, -day, you know, he was a servant as far as, you know, washing the disciples' feet and, and uh, you know, feeding and, and healing and all these things. But he was a servant, but ultimately he was our servant as he died in our place on the cross. And so that was where we started this series was that Jesus was our servant first um, and that uh, he doesn't need us, but we get to be brought into and be part of this mission that God is on as as God's servants. And so that was kind of where we started uh, this whole series. Um, but today I want to talk about what place that servanthood or what place that mission has in our lives um, just as we as we order our lives and as we a lot priorities and fix things and all these things. So um, we're going to read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. So let's, uh, I'm going to read the whole thing, and we'll go back and we'll digest the different pieces of it. So it says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, 
risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation who is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for we for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithful faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So, let's, let's start back here at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, first of all, he, he says, uh, Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And, and the reason here is I, I want to give you a little bit of the context here in which Paul's writing. Um, just, just before this, um, you know, you read that, that Paul's in prison and that he's, you know, he's endured you know, great persecutions, but right now he's actually writing from prison. Uh, and so for, for Timothy, you know, he, Timothy is a guy who was, you know, uh, I mean, Paul calls him my child. I mean, he's not actually his, his son, but like in the faith, Timothy is a guy who learned the gospel from Paul and has been trained with Paul and, and just has kind of, Paul's almost been like a spiritual father to Timothy, and so for Timothy to find out that Paul's in prison, I mean, that's kind of a thing that would, you know, shake him a little bit. And so Paul says, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong. Um, he, Paul's recognizing that, you know, there's, there's uh, suffering and hardship here that comes from uh, following Christ, from uh, being a Christian, and namely it's persecution, and, and so he just here is writing to encourage uh, Timothy on, on how he ought to live and, and, and just to be just to be comforted in that. Um, but he goes on, he goes on, he says, What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust the faithful men will be able to teach others also. Although there's persecution, he says, don't stop, don't stop preaching, don't stop sharing. He says, continue to entrust this message that the the message about Jesus that you've heard from me. Continue to teach it to others who will also teach it to others. And I just want to give a little bit of a side note at, at this point that, you know, this is the pattern of discipleship, that that's what discipleship looks like. It's, um, you know, you see here four generations. You see Paul teaching Timothy to teach others who will also teach others. And, you know, that's what discipleship looks like. It's, it's training uh, people in the message of the gospel to tell others about the message of the gospel who would tell others about the message of the gospel. And so that's kind of a side note, but that's every time I read the, this passage, that's something that really just sticks out to me is that pattern. But he, he acknowledges, like I said, he acknowledges that there's persecution and there's hardship. He encourages Timothy to continue, uh, continue preaching, continue making disciples and, and entrusting this uh, message to others. Um, in verse 3, he says that he didn't share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And so now he's going to shift into this into this picture. And, and this is where we're going to spend a lot of our time is focusing on this picture that Paul shifts into. He says, share in suffering as a good good soldier of Christ Jesus. Uh, first of all, he he makes it clear that that being a soldier of Christ Jesus, that there is going to be suffering, that that's, that's a reality. That as we follow Jesus, there's going to be uh, persecution. There's going to be suffering. Whether that's you know people don't like me um, and I'm not cool, or whether that's you know I, I get passed over for a promotion, or whether that's you know somebody wants to beat me up. You know I don't know, but that's that's reality. Um, and, and in America, it's so easy for us to get out of persecution here by just being silent and not you know in our we almost don't feel bad about it because persecution here is just, you know, disapproving remarks or looks. I don't know. Anyway, I just want to remind you that, that that suffering and persecution is a reality in the Christian life. Um, that's not where I really want to spend my, my focus, but, you know, Paul says it, so I'll just say it. Verse 4, he says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Um, other translations say, you know, his, his aim is to please the recruiter. 
So here's here's the question for you. This question for you: Who's the recruiter? Who's the one who enlisted? Enlisted you? In, in this text, it says, "Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus." So you're a soldier of Jesus, and he says, "No soldier gets entangled." Uh, instead, he's trying to please the recruiter, the one who recruited him. So the recruiter is Christ Jesus. So I, I want you to imagine then that that Jesus is. Our, our commanding officer, you know, we've been recruited by him into his army, and uh, he's, you know, we're gonna, we know that we're gonna suffer in in the service of this army, but um, Jesus is the commanding officer, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, what does it look like to be a soldier with Jesus as our as our commander or our uh, recruiter, um, and just kind of look at, at what is, what, what is that? How does that change our expectations of life? Um, let me let me ask this question of you guys, and you guys can answer this. During wartime, how do you expect wartime and being a soldier to look differently than peacetime and, and being just a civilian? How do you expect it to, to be different? Put yourselves in the shoes of a soldier. You're you've been deployed elsewhere. You know, maybe maybe it's Iraq, Afghanistan. You know, other places in the world you might be deployed. How do you expect life there to be different than life in America during peacetime at home? What in what ways would you expect life to be different? There's imminent danger. There's there's danger. That's very true. There's there's danger at hand all the time. Priority shift. There's less things you're concerned about and you're more concerned about. Maybe, like, instead of day to day life, you're really worried about getting your head down and getting your ass kicked. Yeah. Not stepping on bombs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. You're, you're worried about things like not stepping on bombs. And, you know, you're not, uh, if, if you were to go without toilet paper for a day, in, you know, as a soldier, that would be less. Of a surprise than if you're at home. You know, if you're at home in your house and there's no toilet paper, like that's a big deal. But if you, but if you just survived a, an ambush from a bunch of armed soldiers and you're in the woods trying to get back to your camp and you have to go without toilet paper for a night, that's not as big of a deal, right? It's a different story. Um, you, you know, and there's a lot more, a lot more ways that we think about this. You know, what what do you expect living quarters to be like when you're a soldier? Do you expect them to be very different than if you're you know, at home in peacetime as a civilian, and what do you expect? Um, you know, whether it's food or just everything, you, you know, your expect your expectations during peacetime in your home are very different than your expectations during wartime as a soldier. And so, I'm a, I just want to bring this out that Paul talks about us as being in wartime, not as being in a peacetime. That uh, you know, and, and we'll talk more about. What does that what does that mean? We're in a war, um, but he talks about us being in a wartime and not in a peacetime. And so I think that should radically change the way we think about our lives. Um, when we when we say we're in a wartime, obviously we're not talking about we're going to go out with guns and start shooting people or whatever. That's not our <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. But there's a spiritual battle that's going on. Um, later on, we're going to see that that Paul's speaking of getting the word of God to the elect, to those who might believe, you know, those who haven't heard the gospel of Jesus. Um, he, he speaks about that as being the thing he's enduring for. And so when we speak about there being a war, we're talking about us trying to get the message of truth out to people who don't know it, who haven't heard it. Um, and, and the opposition is, is those who want to squash that message, those who hate that message, and those who um, ultimately hate God and don't want him to be honored. So that's what we talk. That's what we mean when we talk about um, being during wartime. Another thing I thought about uh, as I as I was thinking about, you know, how do you think about wartime? When you're a soldier, um, you know, you're you'll probably have a camp somewhere usually. But is it the soldier's responsibility to figure out food? And clothing and all that. No, you don't. You don't worry about that. Your commanding officer, you know, the higher ups worry about that, and they assign other people to, to you know, ship in food or however that works, you know. But 
Um, the soldier isn't worried about his food. He knows that's going to be provided. He's got a mission to, to accomplish. Um, in fact, Jesus speaks this way in uh, Matthew chapter 6. He says, don't, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink, what you'll wear. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He says, seek first the kingdom is righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. So, as we think about what does it look like to be in wartime, that, you know, our primary concern isn't where's our food coming from, where's our uh, clothing coming from, where's our this and that, and it's not, our primary concern isn't on comforts, and it's not on, um, I mean, just a lot of things that, that are, are different during, uh, during wartime. But he says something very specific here, uh, this, this, you know, maybe more specific than just being in wartime. He says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. What does it mean to be entangled in civilian pursuits? Like, let's imagine for a second that you're deployed in another country. You know, you live, you live on an army base that's, you know, been set up, uh, but there's a town nearby. Um, if you're a soldier, are you going to go and join... But, you know, that, I'm, this is going to be a, a general picture. This isn't going to be a specific, like, oh, so therefore you shouldn't do this thing. I'm about to illustrate it. You know, if you're a soldier, you're deployed, you're on this base, this nearby town, you go to the town, you're not going to go and join the local bowling league or whatever. I mean, you're just not, right? I'm not saying you should never join a bowling league. That's not my point. But it just affects the, the things that you get involved in and the way that you... Uh, you know, what? what is it that you get involved in? Being a, a soldier, you get involved in very different things than you do as a civilian. You're, you know, and that's, it affects it affects the things that, that you focus on, the things that you fill your time with. So he says, and he says here, don't get, don't get entangled in civilian pursuit. Um, I think that would be something that builds up. Yes, exactly. That's you know, and that's how I want to define that. And we we can talk. I want to talk more about that in specifics. And I've got some some things to kind of balance our thinking there. But ultimately, it's things that draw you off of the mission. Um, that was a good way to put it. No no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. You know, you're not getting involved in things that might draw you off of the mission. Now, um, when we when we speak about this, uh, we're not speaking of having no involvement in, in, in any activity that, that people in the world might do. Uh, in First Corinthians uh, chapter five, Paul says, "You know, I, I want you to to stay away from." He's speaking of those in the church. He's saying, "I, I want you to stay away from those uh, in the church who are involved in sexual immorality. I want you to stay away from them." But he says, "But I'm not asking you to stay away from." From people like that in the world, because then you have to leave the world. Uh, Paul, Paul makes it clear that, that the goal here isn't to be separated from anything that's in the world or anything that's going on or any of that, but rather we're, we're to be in the world on a mission, not in the world in pursuit of stuff to do. You know what I mean? Uh, so I just want to clarify that. The other thing that that I want to clarify, and we're going to talk about this, I think, more in, in depth here, is um, as we speak about this, and I'm calling you to a focus, what I'm not calling you to focus on is Christian activities, okay? So I'm not calling you to focus on uh, being involved in, okay, every day you need to be in a church building doing a church thing. That's not at all what I'm calling you to. I'm not calling us to be monks and go and live, you know, and the only thing we ever do is we pray and, and sing hymns and things. That's not what I'm calling you to here. Um, so I just want to give you those clarifying points. But uh, there's a couple more illustrations that Paul uses that I think are, are helpful as well to, just to, to think through. And then we'll, after we look at these illustrations, we'll spend some time asking the question, so what does life look like fixed on this mission? The way... Paul's calling us to. So, in verse 5, he says, an athlete's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So he switches gears here. Goes from soldier in wartime to athletics. Um, 
and elsewhere, you know, Paul talks about being an athlete, and, and he says, you know, an athlete runs to win the prize, that, that they're fixed, they have a fixed goal that they're working towards, just like a soldier has a mission that he's fixed on, that's what he's working towards. Um, an athlete has that same type of fixed mindset. But he says here uh, that the athlete isn't crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Uh, you know, and I considered that, what, Paul, what are you talking about? <laughs> because that, like, what? Well, yeah, but what are you getting at, Paul? And, and a couple of things that I came, came up with that I think he may be talking about is um, in, you know, in these letters to Timothy, Paul talks a lot about making sure that what you're teaching is true and right um, and, and uh, you know, silencing opponents and things like that. So my guess here, you know, especially even just before in the context, it says, entrust to others what I've entrusted to you. That he's speaking about truth, that, that no athlete is crowned unless he competes according to the rules. That he's speaking about not just being fixed on a mission or not, you know, if you're running in a race, if you turn around and run backwards, even if you finish the fastest, you're not going to win because you went the wrong way. Uh, I think, you know, maybe here he's speaking of um, you have to be fixed on the right mission. You have to be speaking the right message. That that's, an important, that's an important piece of this, that uh, not only are you fixed on the mission, but it's the right mission. You're, you're fixed on, on uh, getting the gospel of Jesus out. The other thing, too, that, that maybe goes along with this uh, would, be, would be holiness, that our, our actions and, and our demeanor as we're living in this life is, is one of, of pursuing obedience to Christ in all things that we're, um, we're displaying godly character. That, you know, so I think that may be also what he's getting at. Uh, I'm not certain, but I think that's what he's getting at. And then in verse 6, he gives, he gives the last illustration. He says, it's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. It's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. He speaks of uh, another illustration here, a farmer. That uh, as a farmer, when you labor, you plant, and you, you water, and then ultimately you harvest, that it's the one who works hard that, that receives the first share of the crops. Um, if you're a farmer and you're lazy and, and you don't go out and plant your seed, then well, you're not really a farmer at all. But, you know, or if you're a farmer and you plant your seed, it's a little late, but then you don't, you know, it's, it doesn't grow and, and you don't get the first share of the crops here. Um, let me clarify. Uh, Paul is not here saying, okay, so work really hard so you'll be saved. That's not what Paul's saying. Um, we know that from lots of other places. But, Paul would say, you know, faith works, and that our, if we are indeed farmers, that, that we'll be out there, there playing the seed, we'll be sharing the gospel. Um, so again, it's just another illustration. He's, the, the whole point of this section in this letter is, is to encourage Timothy to be fixed on the mission. You know, so we need to always have, have a broad, overarching context in mind, but his goal here is Timothy be fixed on this mission. Verse 7, he says, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding and everything. In other words, Timothy, think about these, these illustrations, because God's going to help you understand that it's important that you be fixed on the mission. So that's <laughs> you know that's what he's getting at. The, the, all three of these above points is, is keep in mind Jesus Christ and his gospel. That we need to be focused on that. Um, so this is this is Paul's encouragement to Timothy, um, and, and this is the same thing for Paul, actually, that Timothy is to be teaching and encouraging others with as well. Um, and finally here in, in uh, really it's verses 8 through, through 13, he, he gives us one more point. He says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as priest of my gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, 
he also will deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Paul says, remember Jesus. He, he's, again, let's keep in mind Jesus. Keep fixed on Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, is preaching my gospel. His exhortation and all these, all these illustrations is remember Jesus um, be fixed on him as preaching my gospel. That Jesus is the one who came, died in our place, but that he didn't stay dead, he rose again. That this is why this is why Paul can encourage and exhort Timothy to continue in in hardship and struggle as a soldier. Because what if you were a soldier and you knew you're going into an impossible battle to lose? I mean, it would be pretty hard to, to, to take heart and to be encouraged. But here we know that um, even if we get our heads cut off, that Jesus is risen from the dead, and uh, and that's the hope that that we're fixed on. Getting out this message of, of hope and not just a message of you know change your life, but a message of here's here's a God who has not only paid paid our penalty but but offered eternal life to us. So we've got Paul saying, remember Jesus is preaching my gospel. This is why I'm suffering, for which I'm suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. That Paul, again, he brings up his suffering and his imprisonment, but it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. He says, I'm bound as a, as a criminal, but not the word, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul says, here's the reason that I'm continuing in my suffering, in my chains, in my imprisonment, is because this message, I want to get it out to those who haven't heard it so that they can hear and believe it. I'm living this life as a as a soldier, as a as an athlete, as a farmer, as a prisoner, you know, that all in all those illustrations he used. I'm living my life knowing that there's suffering and hardship and pain and all these things for the purpose of getting this message out to those who haven't heard that they may uh, be saved as well and enter into eternal glory with me. So, Paul's main exhortation in this passage is don't get tangled up in things that, that, don't, that don't advance the mission, but rather be fixed on the mission so that others might be saved with this same salvation that we've received. Um, so here's the here's the application question. How do we do that in life? Like I said, I'm not calling you to never be involved in anything that a person, that a non-believer might be involved in. I'm not saying you can't be in a bowling league. I'm not saying that you can't be. But the question is, what is it that you're pursuing with those things? What is it that you're pursuing with life? What are you pursuing with recreation? What is it you're pursuing with work? What is it you're pursuing in all these things? Again, we talked about how in wartime, you know, we're not we're not pursuing comforts, and we don't expect things to be easy, and uh, you know, we're not so worried about food and clothing and, and all these things, but we're fixed on the goal. And so, my you know, my first answer would be. If being in a bowling league is going to advance, you know, if you're going to get to be around some people who haven't heard about Jesus and have opportunities to share with them there, be in a bowling league, be in, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, the question is how in our lives, how do we do that? How do we be fixed on the mission? What what things is this going to change about how, we're, how we live? You know, are there things that we're going to cut out, things that we're going to add? Um, you know, and, and maybe there's nothing that needs to be cut out. Maybe there's nothing that needs to be added. I don't know. But um, I think it's a, a good thing to stop and, and examine our lives. And how are we spending our time? And what are we doing uh, in this life? I know one thing for me that I all you know, and you guys have heard me say this enough times already, but one thing for me that I always have to keep an eye on and keep in mind of is my recreation time. Is, is my recreation time for me? Is, you know, for me a lot of times that's video games or, you know, sometimes it's movies and groups and things, but a lot of times it's video games. Is that time time for me? And is that 
okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just to recoup, or is that, hey, this is becoming a goal that's fixed in my life that I want to pursue and do this thing at the expense of, you know, having time with God in the Word or in prayer, or, you know, I could be thinking and dreaming up the next, the next uh, battle, the next encounter, how am I going to get the gospel out to teenagers, or how am I going to get the gospel to my coworkers, or, you know, and, and so I get, I just get diverted, and so I'm not saying there should never be any recreation time, but I know for me that's a constant battle. Of, am I spending all of my time and my focus and my energy on on recreation with the end of myself? Or, you know, there's I like um, sometimes I get to play video games with some of the teenagers or something, you know, and I like that, and that's the time where we can connect a little bit and you know we'll, we'll spend some time in the word, and, and that's a totally different thing, you know, because I'm rec I'm recreating for the gospel, you know, and, and so that's, that's cool. I don't know, like I said, I, I don't know how that will look differently in your life. Or, so. uh, two things I noticed, uh, one, one thing, if, if at the end where you were bringing out the last few verses, mm -hmm. I think it's really kind of huge that Paul is reflecting and and just kind of bringing out the fact that he is in chains as a criminal. Mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of a, I don't know, a message to Timothy as as he pursues what Paul's telling him to pursue, that even if this should befall you, mm -hmm. here's the things to keep in mind that, you know, yeah. if we've died, we'll, you know, these are, stay focused, stay focused on it. That, he knows full well that Timothy is at the same risk, at the same vulnerability as that. So I just thought that was something that I saw in the text, you know, the way that you were looking through the other pieces. So. And then as you're talking about how it applies to life, um, and for my birthday, I got some money, and I decided I wanted to go shopping. Well, for me, Part of shopping is finding what I want and everything I want about what I want and comparing. So that means I have to look at a lot of things to know what's available so that I can get the, the thing I want. Then I want to get it for the best deal. Well, I did this, and, and I've gone through seasons of this, and it can get really scary out of hand. Well, I'm, I haven't been in a season like this in a long time. And I started to feel it. It was in my head. I was like, oh my gosh, and I'm going to spend hours trying to find, okay, what do I want? Now, where can I find it to get the best deal? And what what tipped me off that it was overkill, it was just beyond what it should be, is that when I was not doing it, it was something rolling through my mind. Mm -hmm. And that to me was a scary thought. Yeah. I was I, like, that's, that's just kiddos right there. <laughs> I, I know that feeling, you know, when it's like, there's something, to, I've said it already, but video games get, for me, like that sometimes, where I'm just like, I'm not doing it, and that's still off what I'm thinking about, um, or even with the shopping thing, I totally understand that, I'm I'm the guy that, I want to find all, exactly what you said, all the options, and then I'll spend, and it's crazy, because I would spend, I'd rather spend two hours to save five dollars, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right, and it's like, it's ridiculous. I could have just gone and washed somebody's car in 20 minutes and made back the five dollars, you know. But it's just about uh, you get fixed on that mission rather than another mission. And I don't know. Some sometimes I seem to be reminded that hey, there's another mission, and I don't know. My my shortage is always time. It's, it's always a shortage. No, so. um, Piper, his website is called Piper circular, shaped like a clock, mm -hmm. and at every, you know, number, numerical position, there was a icon for each social media outlet, mm -hmm. hands on the clock, and he says, and then at, 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 in the last days, um, said something about our prayerlessness will not be able to excuse for a lack of time. I was like, whoa, Al, <laughs> you know, and I mean, every single one of them, I spent three hours today on social media, but 
Prayed, prayed none, you know. I don't know. It was crazy. You know, we, I talked about um, how we don't worry about where our food and clothing is made from. One, one thing I heard a while back, and I can't even remember the name of the guy. We went through a study, but a while back I heard something that no matter where you are, where your paycheck comes from, you know, you're a full-time missionary, but all things are from God. And so even if your paycheck says, you know, Midwest State, or if your paycheck says uh, Midwest GIS, or whatever it says, you know, that's from God, and, and he's given you uh, money to, to be a full-time soldier, full-time missionary, wherever you are. Uh, and so that, that's just a good reminder. That, and, and the flip side of that is I don't have to be concerned about, about where my, my income is coming from because that I'm going to be honest that's something that holds me back I think at work I'm, I'm afraid that you know if I share the gospel too openly well then I'll be looked at as, as not a very good worker because I'm being rude or disrespectful or something when I wouldn't be you know but that uh oh you know what if what if I that affected my job you know, what if sharing the gospel with my coworkers affected my job and and I, that's something I think that keeps me silent. And, but this is just a good encouragement that you know, we don't need to be concerned about where our food's coming from. We've got a, a commander, a recruiter, who he knows we need supplies. He'll get them here. He's, he's not incompetent. He knows what he's doing. So. Yeah. I remember when I worked at the credit union, and at the time I was in my job, was kind of like, where do we stick her office? It, I wasn't in collections, but they're like, okay, you have a table and a desk in collections. And at the time that I was back there with them, there was this guy, Lewis, and he's a very religious guy. You know, he didn't bring up conversations, but we would often talk about things because Barb was a Christian, you know, we were Christ. And so far before I got there, was already trying to fix Lewis, you know. And so anyway, you know, we constantly, you know, bring up things. I don't even know how, you know, we're constantly talking. And one day, I felt like, you know, we just need to just have the word in front of us. And so I brought it with me because he would, he would ask questions. He's a nice guy. But when I brought the Bible in, I was like, what would you bring back? For. It's like, well, that's what we've been talking about. You know, I'm like, you know, we don't have to open it necessarily, but I'm like, but all the things we've been talking about and these questions, I was just going to show you where they come from. You know, but I mean, so huh. nobody fired me though, but Woody was just that kind of guy that he's just a big teddy bear, and as long as you're doing your job, he didn't care if you ate at your desk all day long. I mean, he did not care if you're playing video games, he didn't care. Did you get your work done? Okay, and so he didn't chastise us for like <laughs> trying to spiritualize Lewis. <laughs> I mean, and he never complained. You know, he knew that he was making that call. Lewis, because he, like I said, he was a nice guy, but you know, not everybody's got that personality or that personality. So they, you know, somebody could have easily said. <laughs> Filing a complaint. Yeah, right, right. yeah, I have that. I told you guys that story where uh, there was a Catholic guy at work and you know, he was bringing up different, you know, he, he would even start the conversation, but right. I guess he didn't like the direction that they were going, and so he filed a complaint with his his boss, who ultimately, you know, ended up, I didn't get in trouble, but it was like, you know, my boss, like, I mean, I know you weren't like being rude, I'm sure, because I know you, but. It's not going to go officially on your file, but just so you're aware of this happened. So, it's, it's a real thing to be shared. People will be upset, but I don't know, in my mind, I just here and here's the thing, and this is just me openly conversing with you guys and, and things. But in my mind, I still partially believe the lie that to share the gospel is. I still I believe that because the world believes that. So I'm 
Well, I, you know, um, I read something. Uh, it was just a study called "Ever Being in Pressure," but it impacted me as I think came through plain words. <laughs> um, but it said something about if you if you feel inclined to do something that's not something you would ordinarily do for God, mm -hmm. then you probably need to consider doing that. Yeah. And so you know this little old lady that lives across the street from us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know anything about her spiritually. I know that she, yes. Um, anyway, she comes over and she'll chat a little bit and we chat with her and she enjoys watching the kids and laughing with them. And, you know, Samuel, he said, I love her. You know, you know what I mean? Just really sweet, you know. He thinks she's neat, I guess. And so anyway, she was out there one day with this feeling really good. And I pulled up in the driveway, but this thought in my mind was, we should talk to her. And I was like, then I don't feel good. <laughs> you know? Okay. And I was like, but what if she doesn't want to talk? But I, yeah, you know, I put an appointment. And, uh, you know, and then I thought, I went in the house, and I was like, <laughs> I had a few minutes, uh -huh. you know, and I wasted time. But I, I thought about it, and I was like, you know, I should have. Yeah. I should have approached her. And and would have it have been this material conversation about the gospel right then? I don't know. But more conversations with her might get me to the place where that will mm -hmm. be able to happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, and here's the here's the thing too. Again, remember we're we're in more time, so if you're in more time and, and and you get a cold, you just don't worry about it. You just go on and. You know, and, but I, you know, and I would have used the same. I feel like doing that because I've done that. You know, but I think that's just a good reminder. Well, but you're in wartime, and so. Oh, it's, yeah, it's okay. As you said, that wartime, the medic, the medic's not going to be like, oh, there's a there's somebody writhing in pain and bleeding. You can just step over him and go over there. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, in a sense, I'm the medic. You're the medic. Sure. You're the medic because you have the gospel. We have that. You know, I don't know if she needs it, but I'm I'm guessing she probably does. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so for me to like just kind of trip over her body lying there in need of the medic, mm -hmm. I'm not a very good soldier. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because that's essentially what I've done. Or or another way to use that same illustration is when like we're in we're in battle and we're you know, trying to share the gospel with our our commanding officer, he knows when we need patched up, you know. Got a bullet wound, <laughs> send somebody to patch him up quick so he can get back out there. You know, um, there was a. This was back when we were first Baptist. I had my wisdom teeth out uh, at one o'clock, uh, and, and this was several years ago. Um, I had my wisdom teeth out at one o'clock. Uh, it was deacons meeting at seven. I need to be at, and <laughs> you know what? I was feeling good enough to go to the deacons meeting at seven o'clock because I needed to go and, and be there and, and voice some things, and so. I mean, you guys know that's not normally how it goes. You normally you get your wisdom teeth out. And it's like, you know, there's people that are out for two weeks with that. Nobody will look at me for at least three days. Right, and God said, no, you'll be fine. Yeah. It's fine. You, you just get on that. And I didn't drive there because you know they I, they gave me you know, they put me out, so I wasn't gonna drive that day. But I made it there, and I was coherent and was feeling all right. So. So yeah, anyway, just want to encourage you guys in all of life to be fixed on the mission of sharing the gospel that all people will know that you know it's the gospel. That looks that looks different in everybody's life, I know. Um, I just want to encourage you not to get tied up too much in a lot of things that distract as well. So. Thoughts, final thoughts, questions, comments? I know. <laughs> see, see, preaching a good sermon is all about having good questions. Anyway, all right. Well, hey, let me pray for us. Um, Father, thanks for uh, just your word and the encouragement and belief that we always need. God, I pray you would fix our hearts on your mission, that we wouldn't be distracted by uh, our fleshly desires. 
to your mission. Um, help us to endure hardship and discomfort well. Um, and God, I pray you just give us the strength to end a battle. God, I pray you would uh, keep us from distractions. I just love you. Thank you. Thank you.